Welcome listeners or viewers, however you're witnessing this, to Assiduous Dust, home of the OTSCE uh, On the Spot Collaborative Poem. I am so glad to have here uh, Kautna Singh Chitnas for Assiduous Dust, uh, season two, episode number three. And I can't wait to dive in and get into the grooviness Here's a little bit about Kalpna Singh Chitnis. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, and shh, don't tell Kalpna, I'm using my cheat sheet. Kalpna Singh Chitnis is an Indian American poet, writer, and editor in chief of Life and Legends. She's the author of four poetry books, and her works have appeared in notable journals, so many like World Literature Today, California Quarterly. Indian literature, uh, Pyrene's Fountain, etc. So many. Her full length poetry collection, Bare Soul, was awarded the 2017 Naji Naman Literary Prize for Creativity. Her awards and honors include the Bihar Raj Hasha Award given by the government of Bihar, India, and the Rajiv Gandhi Global Excellence Award. Her poems have been translated into numerous languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, German, Chiz, Arabic, Nepali, Hindi, and other Indian, Indian languages as well. Her works have inclu been included in several anthologies. The most recent among them are 100 Great Indian Poems, published with Bloomsbury uh, in India, in India. Uh, Unseen, which is with Skylark Publications, and that's in the UK, and co Collateral Damage, carrying the branch, the branch Poets in Search of Peace with Glass Liar Press, published in the USA, and Paws Healing the Earth with River Paw Press. A former lecturer of political silence, Kalpa Singh Chitnis holds a degree in film directing from the New York Film Academy, and works as an independent filmmaker in Hollywood. Kalpna Singh Chitnis, Kalpna, it is great to have you here. Not great, it is groovy. I feel, I'm feeling groovy and I can't wait to dive in. I usually start by asking, um, because you've accomplished so much, is there something, let's say, a silly thing that you'd like to do while Re while writing a poem, let's say, for example, uh, as well as a serious thing, people in the past have said for their silly, they've never done skydiving and written a poem before. And for their serious, you know, someone's never just had a new garden and they had never written or composed a poem while in their garden. What's your serious and what's your, uh, your silly? <laughs> Hi everyone and thank you Joshua first of all for having me on your show and I was looking forward to it and I, I, I can see the energy and I'm into it to, to share all um, serious things and silly things I do <laughs> and not just in writing poetry but also um, in my day-to-day -day life because um, life is not all, always supposed to be serious you know there should be some no fun. no yeah yeah so it, how um, can it be sincere if, if it's just it can't uh, so in poetry I just remember very recently when pandemic happened um, that uh, everyone is writing about pandemic. I mean, so many pandemic literature we saw in one year uh, to an extent where I totally felt that overwhelming amount of pandemic literature and mostly about the sufferings of human beings, which we, we uh, were the, you know, of course, the um, millions of lives lost around the world. But um, I realized that uh, we were not looking beyond ourselves, how um, the lives uh, beyond our own world, uh, human, I mean to say human existence. Beyond right, human right, existence, of course. As this affected, is a more than human world, right, exactly. Human so I understand you saying right. that, yes. So how it has affected animals, birds, and all other things. So I, I wrote a poem about um, a bird that um, 
I realized that a lot of exotic birds and like rare birds started to come um, where I live on the trees. I sp started to spot them and a lot of crows. And it was like a, it's unusual to have that many birds coming. And then I realized that we have a shopping center and in the courtyard, people always used to eat. So these birds had plenty of food there, you know, all day long. Have you not written poetry over there before? Uh, no, no. So this is what the, I'm right, right, the silly yeah. thing I'm talking about. You asked me what was the silly thing in it. So I, I realized these birds have nothing to eat uh, in the courtyard and shopping center. So they are now in the neighborhood a lot to looking for food or so. Um, then I, uh, I wrote a poem about interviewing the birds in pandemic, like how they are handling the pandemic. And then I- How do you think that they are handling <laughs> the pandemic, honestly? So, um, uh, like a, a baby bird is crying uh, in, in the nest and I'm just um, guessing maybe her parents have gone out to get some grub in the shopping center. This day, there's nothing for them to eat. So yeah. the baby has to be fed. And um, I thought, you know, these birds cannot um, voice uh, how, what they are going through in this pandemic. So I want to interview the bird for that. What I have to do, I have to put the food out first for them. So the birds start to come and it, it is real. I mean, I have, I have video. This is something that you have done. You, you did I have like, you, you got the birds to come and yeah. you started like, you were like, did you have a journal? Did you have a- uh, uh, right. So I have three birds in pandemic poem, which I wrote and I sent to a journal, which published this in January uh, in Dhaka in Bangladesh. Uh, they okay. published my three poems called Birds in Pandemic. So the funny thing was that, that I'm interviewing the bird at the same time, I'm writing letters to the editors saying that who will publish the poems on birds <laughs> in pandemic. And so everybody's saying that is absurd. Like nobody is showing interest in publishing it. So. Uh, uh, it is like connecting the animal world, the birds, um, and bringing a more world. than human world. Right. And right. I found it kind of very silly as, as a poet, like uh, who is sitting and uh, musing about birds and, you know, I think birds are them. thinking the same thing about us, you know, oh, there's, yes, exactly. there's, there's silly little humans. Uh, yeah, so I shared, uh, my son is the first reader of everything I, I write. Um, oh, excellent. And, you know, and, I find that I'll send to my, my mom sometimes some stuff that I'm really proud of. I yeah. still do that. It's, uh, it's an important thing to do, I think. So I still feel very silly about writing those poems that people will think that uh, what kind of poet is she? She's talking to birds and interviewing the birds, writing poems about birds in pandemic. Uh, so there's a book there. Yes, and a book book is actually, are you referring to Pause Healing That? No, I'm saying I, but we'll get into that. But okay. I'm referring to, yeah, I yeah. think that there's a book to be written about that. You about, uh, about, exactly. The woman who interviews birds. <laughs> yes, exactly. By, by Kalpna Singh Chitnis. Chitnis. Coming so, in 2023 with Penguin. Of I course, know. Penguin, birds, you know. <laughs> So yeah, I do some. Let's make it happen. Let's make that happen. Yeah. Okay, and for your uh, serious, what's a serious thing of while writing uh, 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 poems that is something you'd like to do, um, you know, in the future, or, or yeah, that you have done, let's say. Uh, you mean um, the serious aspect of writing poetry, or, or like where you would be writing poetry, for example? Like you would, maybe you want to write, just go to a Trump rally, blend in somehow and just write poetry there to just get in the midst of it and observe. Why not? Um, not saying that uh, you should, I'm not recommending that. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be brave enough to do something like that. Um, one thing I um, feel um, since I am a practitioner, um, of Buddhism and uh, we believe um, that uh, everything in this world is, is, is connected and dependent on uh, one another. And I feel this is a vital, um, you know, uh, part of information. Let's say, I, I would say it is the truth, but it's a vital part of information that we are missing that we are just thinking about ourselves. So, 
-hmm. about uh, very as, myopic as, view. Uh, yeah, myopic view as an individual, um, as a like let's say certain ideology we follow or a certain political view, uh, and it's about left or right, and we are constantly fighting. And uh, even though we say, hey, we have a right to dissent, and it's a democracy, but then um, as as a uh, teacher, a student of political science, uh, and <laughs> as a poet. I, I just feel uh, that we are lacking uh, the understanding that the left is dependent on right and right is dependent on left. And this is a part There's of- There's the two identity. sides of a, a, a coin and then you right. have, that in fact, uh, one so, depends on each other. Exactly. In fact, and you can't, and, and that's a thing, you know, I guess maybe to get right. political, that so, in fact, you can't have um, one strong political system for at least the way the United States works, but you, you, you need to have uh, more than one strong political system that you can't just have one political, uh, I'm a strong political party, you need to have two to counterbalance. Let's think this way, uh, this head which is sitting uh, on our shoulder is supported by our left and right shoulder both. Uh, if we take out just the right, left won't exist. If you take out left- They both the need right to be right. balanced and they both, both need to yeah. be healthy. They both right. need to be healthy. You and can't you just can. have one healthy party, one right. healthy shoulder or else you'll fall down. Yeah, and also you you would not exist in absence of the other. So it is very important that we see that actually left is also the part of the same body we possess, and the right is also the part of the same body we possess, and that applies to a country, uh, to to the way the way I think, and I feel it would be wonderful to see. Um, I, I see a divide in 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 academia. I see the divide in the in the uh, creative field everywhere uh, one uh, the one side is thinking oh we are better uh, you know writer or poet or activist other side is is not so what are we going to do about it is the conflict is the end goal of democracy is the conflict mm -hmm. is the end goal of our life or we need to come together and find a balance where we can coexist together and i think it would be wonderful for the writers from both sides to come together and do some workshop, like where if we have to share our um, about uh, talk about our grievances or the conflicts or the ideology, they had a, they had a certain thing with Oddball uh, Magazine and the uh, I do stuff for them and the Oddball Foundation, which is a newly formed and nonprofit. And they had a future, no future, which is kind of looking at you know when the voting was coming in and all that stuff of like how do we feel about it and how are we dealing with it internally from a mental health perspective because i feel like there's a lot that's there, there's a lot of things and i think it's important that, that writers of different political parties and different sides should really get together because we should be able to to look well, at I, each I, other as human beings like you're saying Right, and just to specify, I would love to do, I won't say it's a workshop, but a, a thematic uh, anthology or something where mm -hmm. we can accommodate different ideologies, different view to find that before we are leftist or rightist or conservative. What or are we? Yeah. We are human beings with the same aspiration. We all want to be happy. We want to all want to live peacefully. I don't think anybody gets up in the morning thinking that I, I want to kill someone. I want to make someone miserable. Or yeah. I want to I, yes. or Are you familiar with the work of uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T? Uh, he's a, a centrist. He's more a centrist though, but, but he's a great political psychologist, political philosopher. He wrote... Uh, the righteous mind um very interesting stuff and i think it, he has similar stuff and i think doing that kind of stuff of, of bringing that in with literature is a great idea yes and kind of exploring that and i can't wait for that i know you had an article that you had uh you had written uh that uh fit in very well politically um that you had shared uh if i'm Yes, yes, you read yes. that article, which was in India Observer Post, um, uh, because after when the election result came out, uh, it was devastating for me to see how many uh, friends from the right uh, side um, of the uh, the whole political, uh, you know, yeah, things. I have, a, I have a friend yeah. who sort of has that qanon -y, like it's almost an idea, and I can talk, he's a very intelligent, I, I can talk about all sorts of things, but I can't them how he can think some stuff i just 
It, so I, I felt like it is painful regardless. Do you think uh, right now, let's say we have, um, I mean, um, Biden government, let's say is here, right? Is it possible for the Biden government to run the country without the help of right? So no, we can dismiss it. We can dismiss the right the same way, but we lost so many writers friend, because if you vote someone else, they know your political ideology, you are unfriended. It is a painful thing. and I. I told some of my writers friend why you are leaving Facebook. I totally understand you are sad, you are frustrated, you lost election, don't leave. And they have disappeared. It is painful. This world belongs to everyone. This, uh, this, this platform Absolutely. belong to everyone. Um, um, this poetry, <laughs> this literature, this academia belongs to everyone. There's connection. Think? There's connection. I mean, do you think in, in academic institutions, students or uh, you know teachers for the only one ideology go there to teach or yeah. study? No. You, you no. have found, and this was interesting, Jonathan Haidt, I went to uh, the Claremont Colleges in Claremont, California of... Uh, and at Claremont McKenna a few years back, I think it was in 2017 or 2018, Jonathan Haidt spoke and he talked about in the liberal arts uh, dimension of liberal arts colleges, how you have, you know, why is there more, um, you, you have more of the same views and you have even, you have much fewer uh, 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 views from the right side, on the right. Um, and that, in fact, uh, you know, that kind of tears away and takes away from someone's being able to have sort of uh, more of experiencing the real world of many different viewpoints. And he talked about that as it relates actually to social media, which was quite interesting. Huh. Yes. Um, so I'm I'm curious because you you have done a lot of work also with the um, with the uh, you know you've been acknowledged by uh, uh, Bihar the government of uh, Bihar India and you know can you tell me a bit about that that uh, you know uh, you know a lot of people might even not even know about Bihar. They might not even know about different places. A lot of people, I myself can even be, I'm not a, geographically, I am very immature. And I find that there are a lot of Americans and sure a lot of people on, uh, around the world that don't understand certain things, don't understand geopolitically what's going on. I, mean, I know that uh, you have done certain things that have helped not only through your poetry, but also uh, through your uh, film, film advocacy, and through uh, the, the themes that you have done in your in your work, um, you know, and people might not know as much about that as as well. Right. I will um, give it. Um, uh, actually, sorry, there are multiple parts of a question yeah. there. I, I'm right. No, I, I definitely. I will summarize that. Uh, so first of all, um, India is the um, right now. Uh, the second largest in population and the fifth uh, largest economy in the world. And that all India has achieved uh, after 1947, after British left. Bihar is one of the states in India. So let's say it's a state of California and sure. governor of California gives me award, but of course, California comes under the government of the uh, government of India. So uh, this is one in, of the- In this setting, yes. yes. In the setting. So this is one of the uh, literary awards um, I received only when I was uh, 20 year old. Uh, my first book came out wow. when I was 18. And you're only old. what, 10 years older than that? You're, you're, you can't be older than 30. I won't believe you if you say anything. No, I'm much older than 30. I'll get to that also. <laughs> but let you're me a liar, you're a liar, you're a liar. Anyways, I and digress. I, yes. I, I had, um, um, my son was telling me, mama, you were like Amanda Gorman of India at that time when you are so young reading on, on, on the national platform and at the state governor recognized you, you received the awards and stuff. So I think I was very blessed um, uh, in that sense that uh, my first book came out and that won um, Bihar Bhasha Award, which, uh, which earned me recognition. After that, I had three books uh, published in India 
before I came to the United States. But since those books were published a uh, long ago, um, now in, in that sense, uh, you can say that I have been writing for 35 years. So people say, oh, how old were you when you were writing? So like I was writing when I was like 13, 14 year old, um, roughly around that time, my book came out at age 18. And so um, I have been in this country, so now over a little over a quarter a century. So you can do the math how old I am, but- Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> we, not going to we, do that. We, we, we in Hollywood hide our age, so you got to- I know, well, well you so do it very yeah, well. I, exactly. I, yeah, I, I hide my age, so you can do the math later. So uh, <laughs> speaking about India, I think um, people um, who, who study history, um, they know a lot about our country. Uh, we are known, um, uh, we were known as golden bird or melting pot at, when United States didn't exist that way. So people uh, actually see Columbus went to search for such in India and uh, found and he got into the so, Americas. Yeah. Right. So the Portuguese uh, came, the Vasco da Gama discovered India, Columbus failed. So India was like a golden bird in ancient time when every, every country wanted to do trade with India. And that's how the East India Company ended up coming to India. And right. later, they yeah. India. They, later they ruled India. So initially they came, uh, India didn't go under Queen's rule right away. They first came to do the trade with us, do business with us. Slowly and slowly they started taking over. And later, uh, when it be became uh, so big that they were unable to manage it, this is where the time when Queen intervened and then we, India was under British rule. Right, so yes. We got our independence in 1947. Uh, looking at uh, in our progress uh, in 1776, we got independence in USA. So hundreds of years of work um, go, has gone um, behind what we see today as United States. Whereas our democracy, quote unquote democracy, uh, modern democracy, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the ancient democracy in India. Right. There was an ancient democracy in India too, uh, but uh, we're not gonna go into those, uh, mm -hmm. discuss those topics. So it's a, a little over 70 years uh, old country. Uh, it's globally known now uh, and uh, we are doing well uh, in many ways. Uh, besides politics uh, these days, <clears throat> Politically, India is being targeted because this is the, almost the first time when, when uh, a prime minister of Indian origin who is deeply rooted to its own soil and not, not uh, enamored by uh, you know, Western ideology. And it's not like he's not progressive, but he's not, he's, he's more uh, he, he's from, from India. Uh, whereas our other prime ministers had studied in England or other places and, French, yeah. and like a lot of Western influence on them. So uh, a lot of people don't understand uh, India is a culturally diverse country. Um, I mean, in every state has its own language, it has its own food. Uh, and so initially I started to write in my own language, Hindi. But later when I came in 1994 to the United States, so nobody knew my language. And um, I didn't want to just rely on translating my work. And um, right, because uh, things will yeah. also get lost in translation. Right, some of the right. metaphors, some of the yeah. in depth things can get lost. You so know, I've been I'm, reading I'm, some some right. stuff translated from French, and I'm like, I have a dude who speaks French, and I'm like, I don't think this is the same book as it was translated. I'm reading, I'm reading uh, uh, nausea, uh, nausea by uh, by. Uh, like, yeah, by, uh, uh, by Sarja, uh, and a lot of things get lost in translation. So I didn't go that route. And uh, what am I going to just rely on the three books I wrote before I came? No. So I had to, um, um, be, a, a, being in a new country, I had to write in English. Uh, even my family would not understand my language because, uh, uh, my family living in the USA were speaking English. So uh, if I'm speaking in English day and night with my children, with my family, uh, with the people in the school, in college, at workplace, of course, one day I started dreaming in English and I started to write in English. And do, I, do I remember like, that when that happened. Do you remember when that change that, happened? Mm -hmm. Like, was yeah. it like that? That must have been pretty memorable. And it's like you said yeah. dreaming also in English. 
Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened? Uh, I have actually my um, one uh, event uh, I have done actually at uh, AWP. Uh, they are going to um, release that uh, video on 3rd of March. Uh, that is about um, a woman. So, so listeners and viewers, point. you can go back and you can, right. you can watch that and it'll be excellent. Right. So the theme of that uh, talk was uh, women poets sharing their success stories. So in that um, panel, I have shared my story, my journey, how I uh, evolved as a poet of English tongue. But you know, I came at a young age. So I went to College of DuPage. I'm giving you an example. In 1994, 1995, when I um, enrolled myself for architectural drafting and design at College of DuPage, and um, I was also taking creative writing classes. So it all began from there. And uh, even though I studied- That's where your love affair, you know, came right, right, even more right. into- Right, and then I went to New York Film Academy. I mean, I'm writing a script in English. I'm making movie in English, so- right. it And you've started... done work in Hollywood also exactly. that you're active in that scene. Yeah, I mean, there was nowhere Hindi for me. So I, actually English became my own. That's what I mean to say. I told myself I would not write in English uh, until I start- You'll reading. write in your English. Yeah. And you'll so make I, it your own, the way that you oh, want it to be. Exactly. Bring your own, and, exactly. and that must make uh, interesting, uh, especially as an exophonic uh, writer. Um, right. it, it must be interesting, in fact. Right. Right. There's a, the lighthouse, light uh, to the lighthouse, which really looks at uh, exophonic writing, which is very interesting, by the way. But the downside uh, side of this was, even though I evolved um, and morphed into, uh, you know, English uh, poet, uh, in the beginning, when I would write my resume, I will mention my books in Hindi or my work in Hindi, which people would not take seriously because they think because that it's I'm not read in an English, and there's. And you find that that's a thing that constantly creates a divide and, and what can we do about it? I, I, mean, I don't think that there's a, a straight up solution. Right. And I, I was not very good at marketing myself when I came and I, I felt there is no need to do that. I mean, I don't want to um, manipulate into anyone to think that look at me in a certain way. I wanted to be my own self. I wanted to tell this is what I am. You know, this is, right. this is a good thing. Uh, you see a rose plant, it is grafted and it has two colors. It will give you a yellow color rose and orange color rose or red rose because those comes together. I felt the same way when I came because mm. I didn't want to lose my originality, who That's I was. That's a great description of a way of thinking about it. I so people that. look at me still. I mean, what she does, I, I see her publishing in her own languages still. I see her, she's still publishing in Indian magazines. And what does she do? How does she do it? I don't try to do it. It just happens. It, and it does course. you, it kind of comes out. And that's like, yeah. because it, the muse is the muse. It exactly. doesn't matter what language, it, the muse is the muse. It's universal. Someday I will get up and I will write in Hindi all of a sudden from nowhere. And you know, it, it I felt that it has to do with our well, I wish I could I could write in Hindi. So and it has to I'm do envious. <laughs> It, you, it has to do with the association. So let's say if I heard a news, something really hit me hard here and that ha event happened in India. Guess what? All my thoughts is pouring in my language. Because it's going to translate head. from that side. It's going to pull right. memories so and I stuff related to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would not translate it. I will just write it in my language. If it is coming in my language in my head, I will write it in my language. And will you and ever translate it later depending and play? Like, will you ever be like, you know, like, you know how you, ha you have translation machines and you're like, oh, I'm going to translate to one language then again and again and then see what it looks like. And let me tell you, I don't do it. None of my book is translated. I don't translate my poetry from Hindi into English. And tell, let me tell you one reason is why. Mm -hmm. I'm very hard on myself. When I compare my Hindi translation into English, I find it, oh no, it's not the same way as I wrote in English. It's not that powerful. It is not, not uh, the way it is in Hindi because I am looking for exactly my poem to turn out into English and it doesn't happen. So either I write in English or I write in Hindi. So I'm very specific about it. I so cannot what does that do for translators? For translators, the work of a translator becomes so I much harder that, when you yeah. look to take that stance. I, I translate other people's work, mm -hmm. but I cannot translate uh, my own work because I'm very demanding. 
and I'm not happy with my own translation. I feel um, I have my poem has to be 100% in English and Hindi both, and it never happens in translation. You right. always so certain them. rhyming or let's say certain uh, themes yeah. or certain metaphors or things they won't get across as well, and that and that's. Uh, the problem, and it almost in a way of life, is that certain things that we want to get across don't come across. And we're, we're interconnected, and perhaps you know how you have that interconnection that uh, you were talking about how it, in fact, is someone uh, who's a practitioner in Buddhism. Uh, uh, for... One second. Can you just close the blind? It's the sun yes. hitting your face. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Sorry about the interruption. Yeah, go okay, ahead. Words. So as someone who is... Um, practices uh, Buddhism, then you have that, I think there's a term that has to do with, um, I can't, I might not pronounce it correctly, but it's parasitama or something, that there's uh, an in, the interdependence, interrelatedness of Inter all things. Interbeing, interbeing, and uh, yeah, you are talking about the interbeing. Yeah, that's sort of like, um, I, I studied a tiny bit of this in school, but uh, it, it's looking, though most of my, my notions of all this stuff comes from my readings of Alan Watts, of course, who had great influence on me, um, where you take the, um, what is it, the interdependence that all things depend on, and all events depend on a singular event, but also things in the future depend upon what's coming on right now and happening, and same thing that, that each individual part of the environment depends upon the whole, but also the whole depends upon each individual uh, part, similarly with time. And there's this, the interrelated interdependence of things. And there's a very beautiful word that I probably do not know how to pronounce that describes this phenomenon. But uh, you, you tried to say before, what was the word you were saying? Maybe I can guess. Parasitama, um, I'm not sure, I might, oh. yes. Okay. Yeah, unless I see the spelling of the word, um, I don't want to say for sure. But I get the what you are saying. It is it, it is a, a core core actually philosophy of Buddhism that we are uh, the part of the same the super consciousness and everything mm -hmm. evolved from it, and we are interconnect uh, connected, interrelated, and that and interwoven also yes. interbeing. Uh, so being means our, uh, we say human being, right? So we are being, but this being is not, it happens in isolation. We are interbeing. Oh, we are yes. dependent on, on it's one It's not another. a human being, it's interbeing, right? Yes. It, it is interbeing. So everything that I, supports our body comes from outside. Body itself right. doesn't support. If I, I rely on it's reciprocal. On, yes. on, on plants, so I rely on plants for food, then I'm dependent for my being on the plant. So the plant and we are interbeing and the plant is totally dependent on us, how we care for them. And if you look at the plant as your, your uh, plant description of how you're talking about with language and about uh, uh, different languages of uh, uh, the, uh, the yeah, I wonder if there's a way to fit that metaphor into there as well. In the language also, of, of course, let me tell you people always, um, uh, in India, there's lot, there are a lot of languages and sometimes people are fighting whose language is more superior or more developed or who, who should, uh, which language should become a national language or none, none, none should be, have a special status. All kinds of politics in name of languages happen, happen in my country all the time. And here in the USA, I give them one example. Look at English. Hmm. I mean, first of all, we use a Latin script, right? English has words from so many different languages. Mm -hmm. So when English is now spoken worldwide and it's the most effective language right now in the world, there is a reason because English assimilated. It's, it's like a different- Yeah, it takes on other, the, other uh, the meanings from other words and it makes it its own. Right. So similarly, other languages, the development uh, or the e evolution of a language depends. Our language cannot supplement um, everything uh, contributes to itself. Like, let me give you an example. Right now, modern technology is developing. Right now, we went through pandemic. There are so many um, discoveries, invention happens, which has English name. Do you think we need to have those words in Hindi also? 
right? Otherwise, we won't understand. We have to take those words, even though they are English word in our dictionary. And sometimes people make fun of you. Oh, your language is not rich enough to have a substitute of an English. No, it's not like that. Even in English, you say jungle, you say path. It's all Hindi word. So how many guru? Yogi, um, um, yoga, I mean, you name it. There are many words I can give you in English, which is from Hindi language, right? right. So languages are also interdependent for uh, for their own e evolution and how uh, they become more uh, rich and um, efficient. So I think it is very important, and I think this is what you were trying to fit that metaphor that yeah. the uh, interbeing the philo uh, the interbeing we are talking about. I think and interlanguage, so to speak. Languages. Yeah. So it is very important to have the conversation. That's why the magazine I started, um, Life and Lessons. Um, uh, supports um, uh, the work of translation because we believe uh, writers and translators should come together and uh, bring literature from their part of the world, translate into their languages. So it's like a, we are growing the same poetry uh, seed into a different language uh, in, in a different- but It doesn't color. require just exophonic uh, writing, does it? Uh, it doesn't require, uh, say it again, give me some It doesn't example. require exophonic writers. Um, it can be of all different types. You can write in your home language as well. Yes. Uh, yes. For, for uh, life and legends, correct? Yes, yes, yes. exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. And I, um, you know, speaking up for life and legends, I know we had, uh, 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 who was it? Uh, uh, Megasood was on uh, as a, a friend of Assiduous Dust, was on for, um, an episode in uh, the previous season of season one, and it was just excellent. I know that you, uh, she came on board with Life and Legends yeah. and is doing some excellent work, uh, I believe as an associate yeah. editor. Or, yeah, yeah, make sure you join our team uh, this year in, in January. So um, uh, she's new on our team uh, and we are looking forward to working together. Uh, our next edition is coming out in, in May um, or June, roughly. And people and, can uh, submit to that, right? They, they, uh, yeah. It I mean, ends, when is it? And it ends in? Uh, in April, I think submission um, deadline is until April 8th and um, it will take us a couple of months to put things together. So we, we, uh, we, are, um, uh, we, we pride ourselves in saying that we are a journal uh, to bring East and West together mm -hmm. and all other languages together on one platform because we publish translation. Uh, so it's, it's, even though we are international magazine, if you go and look at what we have published in the past, you will find all top uh, English writers published, all American writers published in, 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 our, in our journal. And I am um, saying this in, with much humility that uh, whoever I've gone to and um, shared information about, um, about our journal, they have supported it. And uh, all big name, um, you can see. I mean, I'm just 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 humbled to to say this. And I, 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 that's a hard thing to do, especially yeah. for a journal. A lot and of people don't understand that they think, oh, it, says it will be one of those South Asian journals or Indian journal. Do you have a poem about, uh, you know, you're expressing your, let's say, your humility or, or gratitude surrounding your um, some of your accomplishments, particularly, let's say, regarding, uh, let's just say about uh, life and legends or, or, or talking about um, translation and your, let's say, your, your realizing of translation and how it plays a part in, uh, in your life as well as uh, in uh, uh, life and legends. Do you have uh, like a poem about life and legends? Not necessarily in it, but about it. Uh, I don't have a poem about life and lessons itself, but I I have actually or about the idea that you're doing idea through it. it. It is a prose piece, uh, which 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 is like a poem itself. I I can yeah. read it to you, but it is a prose piece because uh, I we'll that. let it slide. We'll let I'll let it slide. Uh, okay, we'll call yeah. it a prose poem, even oh. though some people don't think that's a thing. But okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, just uh, um, uh, read it to you what I wrote about uh, my journey. And actually that mentions, that's how life and lessons came into existence. So this is uh, very relevant to the question you are asking. Excellent. 
Growing up in India, in a prominent Hindi belt in the state of Bihar, where English was a second language spoken mostly by the elites, where its uses outside of school, colleges, and universities weren't popular. I never had imagined that someday a poet of Hindi tongue will fulfill the destiny of becoming a poet of English and earn herself an opportunity to be the creator and editor of an English journal in a foreign land. Knowing a language is one thing and making it our own is another. My mother gave me the first lesson in English. She taught me the English alphabets, words, sentences, and my father helped me learn spoken English. My grandfather taught me how to make English my guide and travel the world without flying or sailing on a ship. But it was my uncle who gave me a taste for English literature. He was an expert on Shakespearean literature and English poetry. However, when I began writing at the age of 14, I chose to write in my native language, Hindi, widely spoken in India, and the fourth largest speaking language globally. I realized people wouldn't have cared much if I had written in English, which was also a reminder of India's colonial past. Before migrating to the USA in 1994, I taught political science to postgraduate students at Gya College affiliated with Magad University. I had published three books of poetry in my language and had won prestigious awards for my work in India. However, in my adopted country, no one knew who I was, what I wrote in my language and what they meant to me. I tried to translate some of my poems into English, but I wasn't happy with my translations. I rejected everything I wrote and translated in my early days. I began to take creative writing courses at the College of DuPage in Illinois and joined some literary groups in Chicago. But no one paid attention to me as an established poet of diaspora in the USA. My poems were rejected repeatedly by American journals and I was deeply discouraged. I began to sense that my creativity would die soon. I was also getting desensitized to Hindi in my new country and wasn't ready to adopt English for literary expressions. The changes in the geography and social environment changed the sensibility of the poet I was and I went silent for almost a decade. I was incapable of writing in any language during this time my sole focus remained on my family and children. And now I have just a couple more paragraphs. It will end soon. Um, sorry about if it's too long, but I didn't allow uh, rejections to turn into self-doubt for me. Instead, I looked at them as an opportunity to discover what they meant for me. I had a sort I had a sort of epiphany that I was being prepared for a new role and a new identity as a poet and artist. For that, I had to sacrifice much of who I was before as a creative person. In 2000, I moved to California. In 2003, I enrolled myself to, at NYFA to study film directing and began to write English scripts, directing English movies, writing love letters in English, and finally dreaming in English. NYFA broke the language barrier for me and I reincarnated as the poet and writer of the English tongue. Yet the rejection continued and I, warned, and I wondered was it because my bio was still identifying me as a bilingual poet, my books still had Hindi titles, and my name was still bearing my cultural identity? The rejection letters didn't give any of these reasons, yet I felt marginalized. I had my first book in English ready, but I wasn't finding a publisher. I began to share my work on my blog and in social media groups. This is when some North American and Australian writers and editors noticed me and showed interest in reading and publishing my work. Jennifer Reeser, 
An established American poet liked my poetry and wrote the foreword for my book. This gave me a huge morale boost and I was inspired to create a magazine for writers like me and envision life and lessons with a mission to build bridges between languages and culture. Life and lessons changed many things for me in a short time. It helped me build a community of writers from diverse backgrounds and create many opportunities for them. It also allowed me to study and understand diverseness in international literature, which helped me grow as a writer and poet myself. I was further inspired to turn my personal endeavor in, uh, into a nonprofit organization and founded the Silent River Film and Literary Society in 2013, which has served over a thousand writers, poets, artists, and filmmakers from across the world so far. I have been like a volcano ever since, gushing out blocks gushing out blocks of rocks, lava and ashes, only to create fertile islands like one we are standing on right now, growing poetry of different shades, transcending the barriers of languages, cultures, and geography. Oh, I love that. Oh, we do a thing here. We do snap, 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 clap, 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 round of applause. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I love that. That's a great prose poem or prose or whatever. I, I love that. Personal essay. <laughs> In fact, you should send that to Oddball Magazine. Would probably love to do something with that. I bet they're looking for personal essays and more stuff. And it's great that what you're you're doing and how it kind of came about. For me, you know, I actually had, I really like the you know, the person that ended up writing the foreword for your book. Uh, I had a, a professor in uh, college, uh, Albert Wachtel, who's uh, for 40 plus years at, at, at Pitzer College, and he's still teaching, going strong. And um, I, in fact, uh, he, he ended up writing the foreword uh, for my book um, mm -hmm. about uh, autism and addiction and sobriety and spirituality as someone who's you know, uh, uh, on the spectrum, uh, the autism spectrum, uh, and as someone who's a recovering alcoholic and addict. And I found like not many people are doing that kind of stuff that of talking about aut autism and addiction and it's not discussed. So I'm like, you know, let me write about this. And it was a way to honor my grandfather and the fact that my uh, professor then could do the forward. And then I, I started doing stuff for the miracle project. Mm -hmm. of, uh, a teaching with autism uh, and addiction to help neurodiverse individuals and autistic addicts mm -hmm. and through using poetry and they do stuff with film as well but through using poetry and mm -hmm. just another way like you said that we have all these different islands that spread out as mm -hmm. a result of the things we do and that poetry really could help so many individuals through different ways and I, I just you what you I know that you understand what I'm saying from what I, uh, from my experience because I see that in what you have shared with me and what you've shared with all of us so I want to thank you for that oh thank um, you for providing this opportunity to share this story with everyone. absolutely and I know that uh silent uh river uh press I think there's something in the background that says silent uh river film festival or silent oh, river yes. Yes, actually. There's something it's somewhat cut off but it's somewhat in the background oh yep yep silent Film River Festival, exactly. Silent, Silent River, River Film Festival. Festival. Right. Because as I said, when uh, I established um, Silent River Film and Literary Society, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, film is, uh, you know, w one aspect of my life is related to a film, the work I do for living and um, also for passion. And um, literature is a part of it. So uh, I wanted to have uh, this organization uh, supporting uh, both forms of art, film and literature. So we also do uh, um, poetry inspired by cinema workshop at the Silent River Film Festival. And uh, normally I keep this uh, quiet room for my Zoom meeting. So I had that poster uh, and uh, banner there you know, when we were recording something earlier. So yeah, that, that is uh, of the Silent River Film Festival. Absolutely. And so 
that then came across as if you hadn't had done life and legends from everything else and all these realizations kind of it's interesting all these realizations lead up to one thing to kind of one happening and it, it, temporally things are all interwoven and interdependent temporally that people yes. might even say that in fact that um you know you, you know i'll say often if i'm late to somewhere i'll say well time is a construct but <laughs> Of course, that doesn't work that way. But in a way, it is. And that we experience things and, you know, you have he and you trace back the synchronicity or the kismet, uh, kismet of, of certain events. And you see how they correspond. And you're like, well, which one is it that really caused the other? When you look back and you look at a story, just like when you watch a good film, you can see that, in fact, everything happened as a result one thing kind of inspired the other or is it the other that inspired the other and then you have these little to use your metaphor of, of little islands that sprout out from the volcano little events that sprout out as a result that create change and impact in their own volcanoes later um, I mean, I, it happened I, I would say like of course i consider myself a poet first uh, because that's what mm. gave me my uh, recognition um as as a, uh, i earned my recognition as a poet first uh even though i was um an artist i used to do play um and i did modeling and other things before i came uh to the usa and you're I still do doing modeling my, right I, i'm sorry and you're still doing modeling right I don't know. Uh, different kind of modeling. Now role modeling, perhaps. Okay. okay. <laughs> then the fashion modeling. So um, when I um, came as a stage artist, uh, I mean, I did a uh, plays uh, something like you can call it like a Broadway of India, like uh, Prithvi theaters in India, in Mumbai. Uh, I used to do shows there, plays there. So acting was my first love. I wanted to become an actor. And uh, that dream, re I realized to some extent by working in some TV shows and stuff like that in India. But um, for some reason, my poet was appreciated everywhere. I mean, I didn't have to try to establish myself as a poet in India. Let me put it, it that way. It naturally yeah, arises. It so that's naturally. You know. yeah. And every magazine I, I would send, I will get accepted and people would love it. And I wouldn't, won't even know I'm nominated for award. I mean, I, what a 17, 18 year old girl knows to do about marketing herself. Um, in my family, there was no, no one to support me in the sense like, Oh, it wasn't like I was a daughter of a very famous author or artist. I, or I know, I, as a Jewish person, I get it of the, you know, the doctor, lawyer, the whole spiel. Yes. Yeah. So like I was just being myself. So somehow uh, the seed of that poet in me uh, was very prominent and it just it's found its And was very hungry for more and to give back yeah. in many different ways, many different ways. And, but, and would you say that like, the, you know, as uh going into film and other stuff that poetry in fact that if you didn't have that aspect first and foremost that that you'd miss a whole avenue you know when you i guess individuals might think oh well i guess a poet might be necessary cinema yes yeah. cinematography yeah. or certain yeah. things or the writing but yeah, i'm sure that there are many more avenues in fact for the poet the role of the poet um the uh in in the in film industry that probably individuals aren't aware of uh, yeah and let me let me just give you some insight into it so if, when i came here i i always my mother tells me that once something gets in my head i don't forget um and i pursue that thing and she was surprised she said Oh, so now uh, I was in my 30s when I uh, went to N NYFA and um, I graduated there in, in 2004 and I did a uh, full-fledged acting role in main lead in a feature film in Hollywood. Of course, my film was not a super hit film, so people don't know about it, but it went to several film festivals. And I, even, I you haven't seen my film, I'll send you the link of it. So my mother was saying that she will give me a gold medal if I'll complete the film. And so I completed the film. And, and it's hard for your uh, mom. Yeah, in 2011, your mom giving you a gold medal, that's going to mean it. So 2011, I completed a film. The film uh, went to festivals in 2011 and after. My mother still owes me gold medals. She hasn't given me. She didn't give you the gold medal. No, I have oh to go. Oh my, I'm shocked. 
Yeah, so she said, it means like maybe she was metaphorically trying to tell me something. No, or, that means a gold medal. A gold medal means a gold medal. Yeah, so I, I would not leave. And next time I'm going to India, I'll, I'll remind her I need my gold before, you know, uh, you forget it. And so I, I would not, um, you know, let her go that easily. So count on me. But what, one thing my po poet has helped me with acting. Uh, because I felt the the sensitivity, uh, sens sorry, uh, a sensitive poet I am has uh, allowed me to be this uh, the artist I am, uh, actor I am, because um, it, it really you have to uh, the method actors like they do they they feel that they are uh, the yeah. character themselves and I they it's more than just would you say also the poetry, performance poetry, because I'm, I'm a big fan of po uh, performance poetry. I find like if you use certain words, there, there's a thrust to it. There's a certain thrill to it. For example, if you sound, say yes. rage, you say rage, you know, there's, there has to be something to it. And, and I believe like, like also of accents and things have to be utilized and that's important in, in, for acting. People ask me, uh, I don't know if you have seen some of my poetry films, when I recite my poem, I actually don't recite poem just like as a poet goes for reading somewhere, you know. I just, my, act, my actor takes over there. Somehow my voice changes my, uh, the way I am, um, I live that poem before speaking it or reciting it to record it. It's just, I can see my actor and my poet working, do, do both working together. So recording of my poem. The pactor. Like, which is the yeah, poet actor. I don't know what is that. You can find a word for it. Oh, but wow. I, I can see it because my poet and actor, they can't hide from me. I, I, I look at both of them and I see them collaborating and working together. And they're interdependent. Yeah, they're dependent. They're dependent. They're interdependent and interwoven. And would you say also, I wonder, would you say so a big role also is that, um, that faith, your, your faith, or I guess, of, of Buddhism, that, that would you say that that certain aspects and concepts that that plays a fundamental role, I guess, in uh, consciously as well in your work as well? Um, yeah, exactly. Let me first just one uh, thing, which is, I won't say misconception, it is uh, that information people are not aware of, okay, if you're not mm -hmm. aware of something. So uh, we consider Buddhism is almost, it's like an offshoot of Hinduism, okay? Right. But it, it is a more refined way in the sense that right. I- I have a friend that, uh, that, that I have a friend who, who is uh, across from the international uh, uh, Buddhist foundation and he, he lives right across from there in Koreatown and he likes to joke that, um, you know, uh, he believes that at the center of the universe is everything and he and they across from me uh, uh, that at the center is nothing. <laughs> that's I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, I'll that, tell that's, you a, that's a joke. That's, that's but quite no, stereotypical, no. but yeah. No, no. That is true. That is the essence of Buddhism. So uh, what happens that uh, in Buddhism, we believe that the core of everything is empty. So if you see, look, look at this scientifically. But that means empty, empty as in soft also, in the sense of soft and hard and pure and solids and all these stuff. It doesn't it, mean empty as in empty just is. It's much more meaningful. Like how you break the atom and at the end of the atom, you will the find- The space between. And that yeah. space is necessary, like for music, for example. Right. So that film. That's a space is fluid in the sense it is not concrete. Uh, that is space. It's not hard. Yeah, it's not hard that you can have it in a bubble or in a shell or something like that. So even if it's an atom, that that tiny piece of a space is yeah. has the entire cosmos, the universe in it, because at least that. Yeah. Is if you look at all the the space, if you expand it out, absolutely, and that, that's. And if you think about it also with with language and all that, that there needs to be space okay. in between a language. I believe it is a, as a faith because to define a religion, a, a Buddhism as a faith, you have to have a God. And we don't think and it, that- Yes, it's, it's a godless. God. So it is more sort of a belief, a, a way of life for Hinduism and Buddhism is, but there is no supreme God ruling us. We don't, we are not, um, you know, um, it's like a, so different from like how the- I, I myself- I yeah. myself, when I use the term God, an answer to God. 
I'm a, I'm a very, you know, I can, can be a very devout Jew. Like I watch Chabad and Hasidic literature and certain stuff and that came on. But when I, for some reason, when I think of the term God, and this is a thing, I don't think of it as in a creator. In fact, I think that, that is like a lesser role, a creator, because that's defining something. So I think that that's in a way also, but, and this is another take that I think that in fact, that God is before God in a way that I, I, I feel like that it's, That's I don't right. believe in God as a creator, but I believe in God. If we pay attention, um, God, uh, if the, uh, we, we na find the term God, we created yes. God after human uh, existed on earth. But see, everything in the universe was even before we existed. Right. So uh, um, it, it's it's a it's a very um, vast topic to discuss. But uh, in nutshell, we don't have to be uh, answering to any god. We ha we answer ourselves in Buddhism. So our actions. So that fundamental core within us all. Yeah. So anything I'm doing, I'm the owner of my karma. I'm responsible for my karma. Yeah. Any fruits of that karma, I write. And that's another I, thing that's completely mis. I, I, I know that the karma does not mean. Um, it, it's it, you, when people say good karma and bad karma that's not really that's a whole western thing because it's really just your doing meaning that in that in that of your environment that you create in fact through uh the chemistry and the brain chemicals and everything kind of going on that it's your karma it's your doing anything that is uh, taking an action or progressing is the karma like even a plant is doing its karma it is uh, making its food from the uh, sunlight right so plant is doing its karma so karma has to do with the dharma means like every day uh, mm -hmm. actions that we do like right now drinking water that is also a karma, oh, karma yeah. you doing yeah i mean this is a uh, it, that's it, my karma it, it, it's really the cause exactly. and, and so, so would you say that they, it, and you your uh, poetry is your karma. Exactly. Exactly. And you are uh, its karma. Yes. Yes. And you are its exactly. karma. So I wonder if you have uh, uh, one more, uh, if you have a, a poem that talks about, uh, you know, kind of your, your love affair with uh, uh, poetry or perhaps something that talks about uh, certain aspects of uh, uh, your faith. Um, um, yeah, uh, I, think I, I have one uh, poem since you uh, mentioned, and we are again repeating the word uh, faith, but I would say belief. Um, belief, yes, sorry. Yeah. It's so, just no, such no, a no, typical term, you know. No, no, but yeah, commonly used, that's, but I totally understand what you are saying. Mm -hmm. um, there is a poem um, I have in my poetry collection. Yeah. By the way, I, I consider myself a Jew boo, which is a, a Jewish Buddhist. Okay, <laughs> that's a, you. You are good at coining terms. Okay, I have um. Oh, that that's my my. I had a high school teacher, uh, Minaz Sahid Zada, um, was something actually published with uh, uh what is it with uh, oh, I forget which press, but I'll I'll remember um, oh, with Finishing Line Press, but she she coined the term uh Mubu. She said I'm a a Muslim Buddhist, I'm a Mubu. So I'm like, well, then I'm a Juvu. Yeah. Yeah. So that, now you see, so it is a belief. Uh, uh, that's why, whether you are a Jew or whether you are a Muslim or Hindu, anybody can be Buddhist. So if the poem is called uh, Fourth Moment. The title of the poem is Fourth Moment. In Hinduism and Buddhism, we both uh, um, believe that. Um, Say that we are reincarnated, reincarnated not in the uh, in the form of uh, necessarily in the human being that I die and then again I'm born as a human. I can it's be in the consciousness. Yeah, I mean we are continu in continuation. We do not die. Our energy exists as science says that energy can be destroyed. So yeah. if I die, and in, know, in Judaism I'm, they say the the living don't uh, the living don't die die so i'm going to be born in any form i tomorrow i can be a plant or a flower or you know a bird or animal it depends on what form i take up so uh, the poem uh, fourth moment reads i went into slumber and woke up in a new body i took my first step and stumbled upon rocks and my journey to suffering began once again I sat silently for years trying to remember what was it that had the ability to heal. 
But now I can't recall, I can't remember those profound words that once comforted my heart and mind and those belongings that supported my body. I ran year after year without stopping, searching for things, often looking for my own footprints in the dust of time, only to lose myself all over again. I summoned heavens and earth to erupt, to help me find my precious jewels lost in the upheaval of samsara. Um, just, I, I want to stop for a second, precious jewels, we are talking about the jewels of Buddhist teaching here, and samsara means the world. I summoned heaven and earth to erupt to help me find my precious jewels lost in the upheavals of samsara. I will recognize them in a flash if I ever find them again, as I'm an as I am able to see myself in a moment beyond past, present, and future, walking my way, blessed by the great masters once again. I love that. Snap, 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 clap, 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 round of applause. And uh, by the way, when you said at first the jewels, I thought you were saying, is that an allusion to the gold medal that was never gifted you? <laughs> I'm talking about the jewels I have lost, uh, the teachings I have lost. I'm an ordinary human being. I, I am striving to become a better human being. Uh, for that, I need uh, the guidance. So guidance comes from the jewels. Of uh, Jewels means the teachings I had. But that was in my previous life. As a poet, I'm amusing. Maybe that was in my previous life. Now in this lifetime, I'm searching for those jewels to find that guidance, but I'm not finding them. And but you're I, creating volcanoes. It's, it's, it's a different, it's a constant, um, uh, I call myself a seeker. I, I'm seeking still, I don't know what I am. I'm a- You're a silent river seeker. <laughs> I'm seeking. I don't know. Still, I have to find myself a poet and actor or director. It's just uh, the. Or how about just call it not? It's just the manifestations. Uh, it's, it's just like different shades of, uh, you know, color. Speak, speaking of manifestations, would you like to manifest uh, the destiny of our being? it down the silent river or up it in beyond the past present and future beyond these posters of uh george orwell and of peter uh sellers and 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 with vivian lee uh into the fabulous world of otsce on the spot collaborative poem i told you it was going to be corny and weird did that intro lead up to its uh to its merit, to its name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, def definitely. Um, we, we, whenever you are ready, um, we, we will do it. Okay. So, uh, what books uh, do you have out for us today that you'll be using, and uh, and uh, what are the authors' names and, and titles you have for us, uh, oh. and page numbers, the oh. titles, authors, and page numbers you have for us. Okay. So um, let me first of all, um, I have a, a book here, uh, since we were talking about Buddhism. So let me start with, this is the book written by uh, our Zen master, Thich Nhat Hanh. He is a poet himself. Right. He's very uh, groovy. Yeah, and he was nominated for Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King. And this is, this is a full length poetry collection. This is not just a one or two poems. I do not own any of his poetry collections and you have sold them. Uh, yeah, it's from Parallel Express. And the page number which is open is uh, 62 of this book uh, called Call Me By My True Names. <clears throat> and uh, so this is one of the books. And the uh, second book I have here is... Okay. My favorite poet, Rumi. I love Rumi. I have the, over there, I have the collections of, uh, of Rumi, the essential Rumi. Right. And uh, this is um, a poem called Enough Words, uh, page number 20. And after that, I have 
Indigenous by Jennifer Reeser. Um, beautiful collection of poems, page number 78, poem Wounded Knees, Wounded Knees, sorry. And I'm juggling with the <laughs> little space here. Okay, then I have Watch Fire by Christopher Merrill. And um, I have page number 45 open and a poem I'm looking at is called Sacralis. And I forgot to mention the poem, uh, the word um, of Tishnath Han's uh, poem. The oh, which one is it? Will, uh, yeah, it was, um, uh, I met you in the orphanage yard. I met okay. you in the orphanage yard. Excellent. So, so those are the ones you have out? Right, and one last I have, is of my another favorite uh, poet, uh, David Mason, uh, Sea Salt. And the poem I have here open uh, is A Thorn uh, in the Paw. A Thorn Excellent. in the Paw. Excellent. I have out, I have out uh, of uh, Siddhartha of Herman Hatz. Okay. Uh, so I have that out to pages 78 and 79. I have the, um, what is it? The Poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins, fourth edition, uh, revised and large, edited by uh, Gardner and Mackenzie. And I have it out uh, to page 112 and 113, which is the second and third pages of uh, Il Mistico, which is part of the uh, uh, is a poem written between 1862 and 68, and an unfinished poem of uh, uh, G. M. Hawkins. Um, mm -hmm. I have out, uh, I only had three. And my third book is, I have from, uh, from uh, Thelma T. Uh, Reyna. Uh, uh, it's her edited collection of, uh, it's quite new, of When the Virus Came Calling, COVID-19 Strikes America. And I have it out to pages 94 and 95. And on 94 is Day 20, Shelter in Place by Marlene uh, hit and page 95 is uh, Entropy, um, the first page of Entropy by uh, local poet uh, R.D. Armstrong. Yeah, I know R.D. Uh, I had, uh, he had come to one of the readings I did, a uh, poetry festival in Irvine. I love R.D. He's uh, just he so funny. Up. Yeah, he was very generous to bring all the um, books to donate for our organization. Um, Excellent. So, the name of the game, we each piece together, we piece together a new line by reading a couple words and doing that whole spiel and we go back and forth and hopefully we have, uh, it'll be either a masterpiece or a masterpiece. And I guess listeners, uh, viewers, you guys decide, would you like to go first and start us off, uh, Kapma? Yeah, certainly. Um... So I am, uh, call me by my true names, a book of Tichnathan, the word I have open before me uh, from his poem, I met you in the orphanage yard and uh, the word I see, your sad eyes overflowed. Okay. Okay, and so you're piecing together by just looking at all the books, right? Right. So I'm reading one from, uh, uh, you want me to go to other book also? Yeah, so you just okay, piece okay. a few words okay, together. Okay, got it. Okay. So I'm, uh, yeah, from Tishna Tan's book, um, Your Sad Eyes Overflowed, um, Rumi's book, How Does a Part of the World Leave the World? Uh, Bury My Heart, Which Still Must Beat, uh, from Wounded Knee. And yeah, you don't need to say you don't need oh. to say the you, uh, it's unnecessary to say the uh, the name of, of each. Uh, oh, okay, person. I got it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, um, to Egypt when I was a younger man. Once I was a young dog with a big thorn. Okay. Spirits, possessions, riches of lovelessness. Slender silence is presence alone. I dare not ask you with acid soil and white deceit and 
with a rope tied to a rock, not to howl, but the thing howled at. A chain of people in my heart, silent hills, blackness underground, spinning breath, a throne, one. Why, why? No matter how fast you run, by unconditional surrender, through the dust and rubble for the better, into a lay that revealed only itself. The game of discontent, a, so a softening chrism, peace slowly numb, really, the promise of years. I dare not open up your wounds. I chisel the ivory and gold. Only full overhead sun diminishes your shadow. Once while I stood in stormy weather, dove of descent, fat worm of contention, boogeyman, author, I can't get rid of you. I think that's a good ending. I think that's a good ending. Well, thank you. round of applause. Thank you. Kopna uh, Singh Chitness, everyone. Kopna, uh, so I will type that up and send to you. And uh, hopefully you enjoy. Kopna, I want to thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your story, being on this uh, platform on Seduce Dust. Are there any uh, links that you'd like to share? Any shout outs? Uh, thank yous to any people that you'd like, or final last words before we go into that, uh, that good internet void night. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I, first of all, um, I, I want to uh, thank um, you and um, your, all the, people I have met after coming to this country uh, who has contributed to the success of uh, not only life and lessons, but uh, every creative endeavor I have ever uh, taken up on. And uh, I also want to uh, um, just give a um, shout out to all the poets um, who have contributed to uh, pause healing the earth anthology coming up by river pop press you are one of them uh, because as i mentioned to you that there are many uh, of us who are writing about uh, um, human pain and suffering and talking about uh, our existential crisis as a human and um, but i want to look beyond and include our extended family and that that is everything that exists on earth all sentient beings the animals the birds the earth itself uh, river mountains i mean we can go on and on and i want to connect to the um, extended family members and uh, um, we try to do something creative here at um, our platform and uh, river pop press is actually has been established with, with a vision to publish work of creative activism. And I, um, I ask for everyone's support uh, when the anthology will come out in March. And um, I am just grateful for the opportunities I have and, uh, and hope uh, if we come together, uh, putting uh, aside our differences, uh, we can achieve much more. Amen. I, I like that. Or uh, a woman. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's funny that we say that. I love that. Thank you so much. That is beautiful. And I love that message. And thank you for including me. And thank you again. Uh, round of applause, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. And thank you, all the viewers.